Well, hey there. Welcome to the Kim Constable podcast. Nobody cares. Work harder. Oh boy, oh boy, oh boy, do I have an amazing episode for you today. This has been a dream of mine for a long time. And you know what? I've actually just finished the interview and I went a wee bit silly and girly at the end. And now I'm looking back at myself and going, Kim, you're a bit of a dick, really. Like, seriously. But it was hard not to because on the podcast today, I have James Lightning Wilkes. Oh, yes, sir. E, the producer and director of the Game Changers movie, is here to talk to me today. It was, oh my God, a very candid interview where we dug into soy and human behavior and critical thinking and veganism and plant-based and all good stuff and honestly I think it's been one of my favorite interviews ever I invited James on the podcast um a good couple of months ago I think whenever I was on the treadmill and actually what had happened was one of my coaches had messaged me and said oh my goodness I need you to do an article in one of the Facebook groups talking about soy because honestly they're driving me bananas like you know all of these women in here saying soy is bad for your hormones and soy is giving me breast cancer my doctors told me not to eat soy because that you know is bad for my thyroid and and we have never found any evidence to suggest this and of course if you watch the Game Changers movie you will find that a lot of this stuff just isn't true and so I immediately messaged James on Instagram whenever I got this message from one of my coaches and I said please will you come on the podcast to talk about soy and to debunk this because you are the most knowledgeable person I've ever met on the subject and you know it would just be an honor and he came back within a couple of minutes and said absolutely I would love to and honestly it just rocked my world so um i'm gonna let you go and listen to the interview with james i hope you enjoy it as much as i do this guy is just phenomenal it was such a great interview and i will chat to you guys again at the end james wilkes so good to have you here you have no idea how excited i have been about doing this interview and how excited indeed my entire community has been whenever they heard that you were coming on the podcast so thank you so much for being here Oh, no, I uh, really appreciate you having me on, Kim. Thanks so much. And it's so nice to hear, like I was going to say a local accent, but of course I'm in Belfast and you are born and bred in England. But I kind of feel that, you know, even though you're far away, that you're we're quite close together because of the accents. Yeah, well, it's funny. <clears throat> when I go back to England now, some people actually don't know, if they don't know who I am, they don't know where I'm from. Oh, so really? I guess I've picked up enough American accent <clears throat> where they think I'm from Australia or they can't South Africa or something, they can't quite figure it out. But obviously all Americans think that I'm British. Yeah, that funny. always happens actually with my husband. He's Australian. And whenever I hear his brother his brothers and sisters speak, I'm just like, oh my God, I'm horrified because they sound so they sound like something out of home and away. Do you remember years ago? Out of home and away, our neighbors. Yeah. But anyway, James, listen, absolute pleasure to have you on the podcast. Obviously, you are very, very well known, well, probably best known, would you say, for certainly amongst the vegan community for your role in the Game Changers movie. It was, in fact, your movie, your concept, your idea. Is that correct? Yeah, that's right. Um, I mean, as you saw in, in the film, I got injured. And then after a while, um, I just woke up at two in the morning after I'd done some research thinking, I can't believe we've been lied to. And I hate being lied to. And I felt like I had to share that with the world. So that's sort of where the concept started. And do you know what I find out whenever I was doing just a little bit of research on you is that you, we actually, you're an Aries, but mm -hmm. you're born a year before me. You were in 1978, I was 1979, but I'm 14th of April. You're 5th of April. Isn't that right? That's right. Yeah. It all made sense to me whenever I find that out, because I think, and I know I'm not big into star signs at all, but I do find that Aries people are generally highly driven and very, you know, kind of whenever they get the bit between their teeth, we have to go all the way. And mm. I really think um, I would love just to talk about the movie for a second, because I'll tell you what I loved about the movie the most. See, whenever I was watching it, Mark, I love marketing, I marketing and selling and being able to position something in a way that somebody understands and makes sense to them is so important to me. Like it just floats my boat. And as I was watching the movie with my husband, I just said to him, we were actually lying in bed watching it. And I said, this is so fucking genius because you, and I don't know whether this was intentional and I'm so glad that I'm getting the opportunity to ask you because um, I just thought it's so genius because you positioned it in such a way that it hit hard with men who are the hardest to convert to a plant-based way of living because men have a lot of their identity wrapped up in me man, me eat meat, you know, all this kind of thing. And you really went in from the sports aspect and showed performance and the, especially with the guys the jocks like measuring their erections when they were sleeping like that was like the funniest part of the whole movie so I want to ask you was that intentional that you did that like did you have that in mind before you made the movie 
Yeah, well, it was a bit of both, right? So being a man myself, you know, it was one of the reasons that, you know, it was, it was sort of a dual thing. One, I thought as an athlete, I've got to get all this meat and, and animal protein in for strength. Mm -hmm. And and then also as a man, I felt like it felt right that I really needed me as a man, right? Mm -hmm. So there was sort of, you know, going into it, <clears throat> it wasn't really artificial in that sense. It was a, an organic sort of thing that happened, mm -hmm. but it sort of tracked with um, the research. So when we looked into it, we found that eight out of 10 plant-based people were female. Mm -hmm. And then we found out that five out of six people who go meat free end up going back. And the number one reason cited was social pressure. And the number one sub reason within that was the male partner in the household. So even if a lot of females were trying to go more vegetarian or vegan or just shifting plant-based, the males in the household typically were sort of keeping them from doing that. They didn't want to cook two meals uh, and so forth. And so, you know, young men, 18 to 45 year old men eat twice as much meat as women. So we felt like um, in addition to my own sort of organic journey of like really feeling like I needed meat as a man, that um, the research was showing that the movement, for lack of a better term, wasn't really appealing very well to that young demographic. Um, fast food menus are geared towards young men. Um, a lot of diets, even if they're geared towards women, a lot of times um, they also don't want to put men off from doing it. And so meat's usually a factor in, in most diet programs. Um, and so we just felt that, um, yeah, appealing to young men. And as you said, with sports, the great thing about sports is it appeals. It doesn't really matter how much money you make. Uh, it doesn't matter if you're a left wing or right wing in your politics. You know, it's sort of a, a central factor that, you know, everyone can sort of get behind. So for those reasons, and just sort of naturally being an athlete and a man myself, those things came together. And, um, and, and definitely we thought that young men, especially young men who don't care as much about their health, right, um, right uh, would um, hopefully resonate with a film like this. Yeah, with the performance aspect. And also mm -hmm. that that's really true what you said, because I've looked at veganism for years. I mean, I'm not, I have not been vegan my whole life. I've been vegetarian for 17 years, but I only really went vegan about six years ago, six or seven years ago. And I'm not even fully vegan in terms of the, you know, whenever I first went vegan, I didn't even know what veganism was. I thought that it just meant you didn't eat meat. I didn't know that it meant you didn't wear leather and wool and cashmere, that there was a, right. the term plant-based. I didn't even know there was a difference. Hence the name, The Sculpted Vegan. And so I get a lot of hate online now. I get all the, the vegans, the ethical vegans fucking love to hate me because I'm not vegan enough to be vegan, even though I've single-handedly transformed probably hundreds of thousands of people to veganism. I'm still not vegan enough to be vegan, but that's a story for another day. So uh, what was I going to say about this? So, so basically, yeah, I love what you're saying because I think that women, because we're such emotional creatures and because we feel so deeply, like I see people trying to convert people to veganism. Um, first of all, you can never try and convert anyone to anything because think how hard it is to change yourself and then think how hard it is to change somebody else. It's virtually impossible. But I, th I see them doing a lot of stuff with other documentaries like Forks Over Knives and all these kinds of things, which I've actually never even watched, but they're all about tearing at the heartstrings, you know, making you feel bad, making you feel like you're a bad person for causing all this suffering and anxiety. And nobody wants to see that you know, but bring in the performance, which is what men are about. You know, do you know, my husband went fully plant-based after watching that movie because oh, we live at home and I cooked and we have a private chef now, but because I did most of the cooking, he, he would have eaten plant-based at home. He was happy to, because I'm a bodybuilder. So I always have high protein in the house and that's all he was concerned about. But every time we went out for dinner, he had a steak or chicken or some kind of meat. And after watching the game changers, he stopped and he started quoting it to his friends and quoting it to his rugby buddy. And I was like, oh my God, so powerful. So I just wanted to tell you, you probably know, I'm sure people have told you this, but I just wanted to tell you how powerful the message was in case you were in any doubt. Yeah. I mean, we've heard the same sort of thing from a lot of um, people who said, oh, my husband, you know, I've been vegan or plant-based or vegetarian for years. <clears throat> and I couldn't convince my husband. Then he watches the film and all of a sudden he switched. Um, but yeah, we certainly know it's been impactful. It appears to be the most viewed documentary of all time based mm -hmm. on the estimates that we've had done. <clears throat> we had 1.5 billion media impressions with over 40,000 organic press articles written about the film. And wow. according to metrics on Google Trends, interest in plant-based eating more than tripled worldwide within a couple of weeks of the film hitting Netflix. So mm -hmm. we definitely know it's had a huge impact. And then anecdotally, you know, before the pandemic, um, I was going, you know, going to whether it was a restaurant or the grocery store or Home Depot. I'm not sure if you have mm -hmm. that um, yeah. over there, but um, 
you know, wherever I would go, I, I couldn't go anywhere without getting interrupted. You know, even just like getting dressed at the, uh, in the changing room at the gym, people wouldn't even give me a chance to put my underwear on before oh coming and saying something. So uh, anecdotally, it certainly had a, uh, you know, a big impact. Um, people recognizing me from the film and it seems to uh, have really hit that demographic of people that otherwise perhaps wouldn't have heard the message. How was that personally um, being recognized? Did you feel like a bit of a, um, I have it on a very small level, you know, I'm pretty well known in Belfast as the sculpted vegan. And so quite often when I go out to restaurants right into Belfast, somebody always wants to come over and sit and talk to you or they, you can see them nudging their friends and whispering and there's the sculpted vegan. And, and I, so I have it on a very small level and I find it hard sometimes because you just want to go out and have a private meal with your husband or with your family or whatever. How was that for you after the movie? Did you enjoy it or did you find it? Um, well, I'd sort of experienced it a little bit before winning the ultimate fighter, you know, yeah. sort of, especially like uh, in certain settings. So you go to the UFC expo and it's hard to walk around without people trying to take pictures. <clears throat> so about 10 years ago, I'd sort of had a little bit of experience. Um, this was on a larger scale, obviously, and, you know, to start with, it was great. I'm like, oh, yeah, we'd, you know, and it still is a good feeling that we've had this huge impact. Uh, but on a personal level, it is quite challenging uh, yeah. to be able to go anywhere, um, you know, whether it's a restaurant or whatever, because, you know, ba basically my whole family gets ignored and then people just start talking to me and feel like they can come and interrupt. And, you know, again, it's great. It's sort of a mixed, right? It's like, okay, great, mm -hmm. we had a huge impact. Yeah. Um, but it does get frustrating. I can't imagine actually being famous, Right. Um, you know, like some of these big Hollywood stars, wow. because <clears throat> I think I would find that very frustrating and, and wouldn't enjoy it. Yeah, no, I, I know exactly what you're saying. And so I tell you why, or was something else I wanted to talk to you about. Part of the reason why I invited you on the podcast, and I loved our, our conversation. I'll tell you how it happened, right? I was on the treadmill in the gym. I think I told you I was on the treadmill at the time. So I'm on the treadmill in the gym and one of my coaches messaged me and she was like, please, please, dear God, can you go into the Facebook group? And we have 22 Facebook groups for, for, for all our different programs. And one of the coaches messaged me, she was like, please, can you go in and go live in the group and do, um, do like another live about soy? I can't answer these fucking questions anymore. You know, people saying, I can't take soy because it affects my hormones and my thyroid. And my doctor told me to avoid soy. And, you know, we're constantly battling. We actually have it as a trigger word in our groups that if someone mentions soy, they have to have their comment approved because what happens is misinformation information gets spread. Someone says, my doctor said, you know, soy is giving me breath, has given me breast cancer. And they post that. And then everyone starts to panic in all the comments. So we have to be very careful with what we put in the groups. And so I was on the treadmill when this came through and I said, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to message James Wilkes. And so I just went onto your Instagram page and I just messaged you. And you literally came back within five minutes. You were like, yeah, I'd come on your podcast. And then of course I felt really, I was like, oh, he knows me. He said he's a fan. And I was really like, you know, I have to say that was a real shock for me. But um, anyway, uh, I, and your wife, I think had just done buns and guns. I think she had just bought yeah, the program. Just signed up for the program. Just signed yeah. up for the program. So sorry, there's something loud going past there. I'll wait for it to go for a second. So I, I, uh, you are here as my spokesperson, James, if you are willing to be, because I am not, I have done a lot of research into soy, but I have done nowhere near the research you've done. I've done Google research into soy. So I would not consider myself a certified expert in any way. But I do know one thing that I have not been able to find in all my years researching bodybuilding and health and nutrition. I've not been able to find one single credible scientific research backed paper that says that can confirm that soy is bad for you. So here is my question. I'm going to start putting the questions to you, okay, that people put to me about soy. And would you be happy to kind of do a quick fire round and, and answer them? Well, it's not quick fire, actually. Go as long yeah, as Yeah, it, it's. Uh, I definitely have to do a quick fire round. It also might be interesting to give a little bit of background about where this all started as well. But we can Do start that first. Do that first. Okay, give us the background. Great. I want to know yeah. everything. So I'm not sure if you know where this started. It started back in 1951 with no. uh, two Australian chemists. And they were, uh, in, in Australia, they were looking at what the cause of was for an epidemic of infertility in sheep. And it, it took them 10 years, but they finally figured out the cause. And so what it was, there's a, a compound uh, present in a type of clover that they were eating called genistein. Mm -hmm. And that is the same estrogen, uh, the primary estrogen that's also in soybeans. So they, eat, they were eating this clover and they were becoming infertile because it was impacting um, their hormones. Mm -hmm. And so from that, then, then also became some studies about phytoestrogens in rats. 
of course, both sheep and uh, rats me me metabolize things differently. Um, but what people didn't really look at is the amount of levels that were in these studies. So they were feeding the rats extremely high levels of phytoestrogens that you wouldn't find in food. And if you were to get as much as the sheep were getting from the clover, you'd have to drink more than um, a thousand cartons of soy milk a day or eat 8,000 soy burgers or around 800 pounds of tofu a day. So that's something that, you know, people aren't looking at, right? It's like, okay, gen genistein, this phytoestrogen was having an impact in sheep. That's starting a concern. Studies in rats, there's a bit of a concern. <clears throat> but as you know, they give these super high doses when they do studies in rats. And again, some things that affect rats don't even affect mice, let alone, you know, affect humans. <clears throat> so that's the first thing to think about is that the, the, the doses are just, were just incredibly different in terms of mm -hmm. the effect. Mm -hmm. Now, there are two case reports, and this is just of single people, right, of people sort of two, two men developing uh, gynecomastia from, they thought, they, weren't, they don't know, they never did an interventional study. They just happened to be eating 14, between 14 and 20 servings of soy a day in these two single individuals. So just the weakest form of evidence, right, basically is like, other than just anecdotal, a friend saying, oh, I ate this and I feel more feminine. The weakest form of evidence on, on the uh, pyramid of hierarchy of evidence is just two single cases of people having some sort of feminizing effects. And it just so happened that correlationally that they were having huge amounts of soy. I mean, it was like pretty much all they were eating. <clears throat> and so as a combination of these things between the sheep and the study and rats, and then these two case reports, you know, this is sort of where this myth started that soy could be feminizing for men. There's other myths as well around, you know, breast cancer and prostate cancer because those are sort of hormonal cancers. Um, but if you look at the actual robust evidence, um, there's, there seems to be no problem at all. Now, there is a dosing element where getting to uh, 14 or eight, even eight servings or more a day there may be some issues that people aren't sure. There's no concrete evidence, but eating in the sort of normal amounts that anyone would eat, um, you know, it's a protein dense food, uh, as you know, that's full of B vitamins, fiber, potassium, magnesium. It's a, a great alternative, or I would say really an improvement, obviously on, on eating meat, for example. So there's just really no, uh, no issues with it at all, but we can get into some specifics around male, men and testosterone and breast cancer and, <laughs> and so forth. Uh, yeah, I remember well. reading a study that, and again, I'm, I'm not going to be able to quote it very well because I haven't done a lot of research, but I remember reading a study about, about breast cancer and soy, and it said something like, and you may know better than me, hopefully you will, um, but I'm not expecting you to, because you're like, shit, what's she going to say? Like, am I going to know this or not? Um, so basically it was like, there's a compound in soy, which they found is, uh, is, is similar or it is a compound that is in the breast whenever it has breast cancer. And so they said, because this is in soy and it's also in breast cancer, it might be better to not eat soy just in case this might cause this to increase or eating soy cause this. No, here's what it was. Eating soy caused this, the cells or whatever in the breast to increase. And these are the cells that if they're going to become cancerous will become cancerous. So they kind of jumped from, if you have more of these, it might be more likely to be cancerous or to turn cancerous. So just don't need it just in case. And I was like, really? That's where the whole soy causes breast cancer came from? Like, you know, soy causes these cells to increase. And these are the cells that are going to turn cancerous, turn cancerous. So don't eat soy in case the cells are there when there's no link to them turning cancerous. I couldn't see how people made that jump. But yet, for some reason, it's very common in the medical world to, you know, as soon as someone's had a breast cancer or is at risk for breast cancer, they're told avoid soy, avoid soy, avoid soy. Do you have any kind of thoughts or research on that? Because we do have a lot of women obviously listen to this podcast. Yeah, well, there's actually, um, so, so I don't know if you're aware, but there's actually two types of estrogen receptors. There's alpha receptors and beta receptors. And I'm unlike say, animal yes, estrogen, that makes me look smart. I'm going to say yeah. Yes. This, this, <laughs> the uh, the soy the soy phytoestrogens again, which are phytoestrogens, not the plant estrogens. They're not the same. Unlike animal products, by the way, where the estrogen in all animal products, meat and dairy and eggs, is identical to human uh, right. estrogen. So if people are concerned about estrogen, 
they shouldn't be concerned about soy leakage tubes, especially drinking cow's milk where the yeah. cows are made pregnant annually. I mean, if you want to talk about estrogen, um, then you want to talk about animal products, obviously. But there's alpha receptors and beta receptors. And unlike animal estrogen, uh, the soy phytoestrogens, they bind preferentially to the beta receptors. Mm -hmm. um, now, it does seem that in some of these studies, they'll use isolated phytoestrogens in very high amounts, like looking at stuff in a Petri dish, for example. Mm -hmm. And so if you do it in these isolated amounts, uh, even though they would bind preferentially beta receptors, if they get full, then they might start hitting these alpha receptors. And I think that's where there might be some confusion, whereas the uh, animal estrogen uh, in the, uh, in the um, alpha receptors may be creating... Uh, cancer cell proliferation, whereas the phytoestrogens are actually limiting that and bringing that down. Mm -hmm. But if you start messing with extracting these isoflavones and phytoestrogens from soy and putting them into um, in very, very large quantities, after the beta receptors are full, there's nowhere to go. You know, so it's a, it's a little bit complex. It's not quite mm -hmm. as simple. Mm -hmm. um, but if you look at um, the research, there's a lot of research showing that people who had breast cancer originally, who then ate more soy, lived longer, and had a lower risk of it coming back. And then Loma Linda um, University did some research showing that replacing cow's milk uh, with soy milk decreased breast cancer risk by 32%. Wow. So, I mean, just overall, it's just in terms of breast cancer, um, soy is going to be beneficial. Again, I'm not a registered dietitian or even, you know, although I've now spent over 3,000 hours looking at peer-reviewed science on nutrition, I'm certainly uh, not a dietitian or, um, you know, uh, don't have qualifications in that regard. Um, and I'm certainly not a soy specialist, um, but there's been some really good um, meta-analyses done recently just showing the health benefits of soy. And, and just sort of related to that while we're talking about breast cancer and, and females, there's also been a lot of research done on menopause and hot flashes. Um, and so I don't know if that was going to be one of your questions. Uh, well, we're but, developing a menopause program at the minute. So I am all ears. Yeah. So over the past 20 years, um, there's been over 50 clinical trials on the, uh, the use of soy foods and soy supplements on the alleviation of hot flashes. And a meta-analysis, so basically looking at all of those studies, showed significantly reduced symptoms in, uh, in hot flashes, significant reduction. I can't remember the exact numbers. Um, and not just in hot flashes, but there are, are some studies also where they've looked at vaginal dryness during menopause, and there's reduced vaginal dryness also with increased uh, soy intake as well. So for females that are worried about breast cancer or going through menopause, you know, it's really, um, they shouldn't be considering that an issue. I just love that. And I have another question for you, which is where did you get this way? How did you get this way? Like, how did you get to be such like, cause I am like you, that's why I love, I totally geek out on stuff like this. And so I'm listening to you and I'm like, like, where, where did you become like an information junkie? Like, where did you, where did yeah, you just, I, that you just well, love? I mean, it wasn't like this in school because I wasn't very interested in the topics that I was studying. Mm -hmm. um, so I actually don't think I actually ever read a book. I think there was a book called Peter and Jane when I was like five years old or six years old. But between then and the age of about 30, even going through my degree, I didn't actually read a book. Um, so even to get through my, deg my bachelor's degree, um, I would read the, uh, the intro, the first paragraph of each chapter, and the conclusion and then the back of the book yeah. and, uh, and basically like the cliff notes, right? So I never actually really read a whole book until I was 30 and then, um, and then really started studying nutrition and just was passionate about it. So I think if you're passionate about it, I also think I'm really driven because I, I really hate dishonesty and being lied to. And I think that's what the animal foods industry has done, right? So I had, you know, I had people giving me misinformation um, without intent of giving me misinformation, like my parents saying, you know, eat up, you got to eat all that meat. You know, as in the film, I was lucky to find that old footage of when I was a kid with my dad saying, you know, it was what a Superman eat. I was five years old, which is really crazy because we had maybe like 40 or 50 ta uh, four hour tapes sitting at home. I grabbed 20 of them, brought them to the US, had them digitized. And the first, I just, you know, I just clicked on a random spot. First thing I clicked on, 
looking at these digitized videos and it was the Superman footage. And I sent the team as I can't believe I just found this, right? That this, I found this super, because a lot of people said, was that Superman footage in the film when you were five years old saying to be strong and like Superman, I got to eat, you know, lamb chops and eggs and whatever, and all this meat and dairy. Um, so there's, so there's that sort of misinformation from parents where there was no malintent. And then there's, you know, from the animal foods industry where I a hundred percent think that there's, um, purposeful intent to mislead people both through marketing and through the infiltration of the scientific literature. And so I just really hate being lied to and felt that it was my, since I'd found this out, uh, not that a lot of other people obviously haven't found that out as well, but no one had really put it out in the, in the way that we had. And so in addition to sort of showcasing the, the athletes in the film and interviewing some of these experts, you know, a chunk of the film, we really don't want to show that you've been, you've been tricked by the, the, the industry. And so in that regard, I feel like really driven to really do a deep dive uh, into the research. And again, there's people on my team that are just much more well, uh, much better informed than I am on the science. Um, but I feel like I've, I've learned a fair bit. Yeah, but never underestimate a man with the mission. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know what? I I would love to ask. Actually, just listening to you talk, I'm I'm all about kind of the deeper reasons behind things. I just love human psychology. Mm -hmm. Um, I can hear one of my chickens clucking outside the window because <laughs> can, you can't hear it, can you? My chickens are outside the window. <laughs> They're so funny. They now have realized that the house. Do you hear it? Yeah. Yeah. They've now realized the house is a great source of food. So they constantly try and come, they constantly come into the kitchen and wander through the house. So I was going to say, whenever you said, I hate being lied to, do you, um, I'm going to have to chase them. This is going to be in the, this is going to be in the recording. Um, do you think whenever you got injured, because I, as a performance, as a, as an athlete, as someone whose livelihood, if you like, is, is tied to, your body and, and how you perform. I imagine that whenever you were injured, it must have been um, it must have been scary, probably frustrating. And and that's whenever, you know, from watching the movie, that's whenever you became really driven to find out how to heal yourself. Do you think that was part of the the thing that really drove you into um you know into healing yourself and trying to find the research into what would be the best way to heal yourself and then yeah. discovering Everything yeah, it was a huge, uh, a huge motivation. I mean, the time I got injured, I was going to physical therapy. I knew wouldn't, I wouldn't be able to train for at least six months. And I thought, well, how can I spend my time productively? I really want to heal as quickly as possible. And then when I started reading, I also thought, oh, not only do I want to heal as, as quickly as possible and recover, but then when I am recovered, I, I, it looks like I can actually perform better. Right? So I didn't really realize the power of food. So as an athlete wanting to perform better and wanting to recover as quickly as possible, that was a huge motivation. So I think if you couple that and then finding you've been lied to and then wanted to sharing it with everybody, um, yeah, that was, a, that was a huge, uh, huge motivation. How did you get into the martial arts? Was that the first discipline that you mixed martial arts? That yeah, so um, I was eight years old and my dad put me in karate. So my, uh, my uncle was a very good uh, karate practitioner he fought in, in uh, Crystal Palace in, in England in 1986, I think it was, and got one of the fastest knock, knockouts and with a spinning hook kick, hit kick someone in the temple with his heel, knocked him out in like three seconds or something from the beginning of the match. Wow. And so that was quite inspiring. You know, my grandfather faked his birth certificate um, when he was, I think, 14 or 15, and uh, so he could fight in World War II. And then when he came out... Um, and he survived some stuff that uh, most of his troops didn't survive. And he came out and he was sort of a tough guy and, and afterwards used to get in fights in the pubs. Uh, and then my dad did Kung Fu. So it was sort of fighting and, and martial arts was in the blood and the family a little bit. Although when I was put into it at eight, I didn't really enjoy it that much. They were really pushing you. It was like a hard style. I was, I was kind of young. Um, and then I stopped it for a couple of years uh, I just wasn't uh, available at the time. And then at 15, I really started getting into uh, Taekwondo. I then went to Coventry um, and trained with a guy called Jeff Thompson when I was 17 and, they, and do a thing called Animal Day, where basically like there's there's no rules. Um, you'll sometimes have, there's a lot of doormen. And so they'll, they'll do training where you've got like 30 people standing around you and you don't know who's going to be the problem and you're trying to calm people down. And then suddenly three or four of them will just start attacking you and, you know, they're, they're, they're pulling your testicles, they're biting, that 
it's uh, uh, a pretty crazy oh. atmosphere. And then I then I realized that the taekwondo alone probably wasn't <laughs> wasn't really up to scratch, you know. And I got slammed on the floor and had no idea what I was doing. Um, so between that and then an instant when I sort of got um, beat up on the street a little bit when I was fifteen, that really drove me to pursue and, and really uh, get good at the martial arts. Um, so it sort of all started there. Was it like a self protection in a way? Yeah, yeah, definitely a self. I think when I was 15 and realized, um, you know, I, I was already doing a bit of Taekwondo and I got beat up. I got smacked in the lip and I was bleeding and then smacked in the nose. And it just really sort of was like a deer in headlights, didn't, didn't know how to act. I just thought that's never going to happen to me again and, and really focused um, on the martial arts from that point forward. Do you think that your background as a very well-respected fighter, um, as an athlete, do you think that um, that it's given a lot more credibility to the plant-based movement? Do you certainly? Yeah, that- I, think, I think in a couple of ways, not just as an athlete, but I think especially as sort of a. a in fact, when I started doing this, and with Joseph Pace, who's the other producer who, and the main writer of the film, who deserves a lot of credit. Um, you know, when I said to him, I want to, we started working together and want to make this documentary. And I said, but I don't really want to be in it. I just want to produce it. And we will interview these other athletes. And he said, no, 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 you've got to be in it. You know, you're, you're a a fighter, you train Navy SEALs, you, uh, you skydive and jump out of airplanes, you ride motorcycles at high speed. Like, you know, if there's a, you know, if, if you're trying to have set off this sort of masculine or tough image, Um, this is going to be really helpful. So I think as well as being an athlete, I think particularly being a fighter um, Mm -hmm. has really helped, you know, with a lot of young men that feel that they've got to be macho or whatever. Um, And it was interesting because a lot of the athletes that we interviewed afterwards, they always wanted to learn some fighting from me. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I think that sort of combat sports background um, was helpful in in both attracting some of the – the athletes that we interviewed, like they were interested in sort of talking to me and learning stuff from me and, and I think had that respect. So it helps set up the interviews for the film. And then I think in the film, I think it also, um, you know, and, and the research actually talking about psychology, we, in 2014, we did a lot of um, behavioral psychology research and it sort of tracked with my own sort of feelings. But there's something called the backfire effect where, if people believe in their position and it's tied to their identity, they're more likely to dig their heels in deeper when you present new information. Um, and this was studied by uh, Professor Hank Rothgerber of Bellamine University. Information around animal welfare, environment, and health was given to young men and women. Mm-hmm. Um, and three months later, the women were eating less meat than before, and the men were actually eating more. And in the short term, for example, they felt compassionate for the animals, but compassion is synonymous with femininity. And uh, uh, compassion is, um, yeah. If men start feeling compassionate, they start feeling a bit feminine. They feel the engaged to need to engage in masculine masculine behaviors, and meat eating is like really at the top of that. And then in terms of health, um, a lot of people are trying to prove that their genes are stronger than other people's. So if you tell a young guy, "Don't smoke," uh, it's bad for you. He might smoke more just to show you that it's not going to kill him. So from a health perspective and a sort of compassion perspective, um, there's a lot of behavioral psychology going on. And uh, interestingly, um, as you sort of mentioned there, being a fighter and um, be- being a man, the, the, the behavioral psychology research shows that the antidote to the backfire effect of showcasing role models and so not that we're trying to say what a real man is, but when you've got athletes, firefighters and soldiers, mm-hmm. um, you know, eating this way, I think that has a significant impact, even greater than the actual science. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's, it's pretty interesting. From well, I think there's leaders and there's followers, you know, and, and if you really want to, you know, I, I'm not into what is a real man, but certainly I know it, it takes a certain strength of character to stand your ground, to go a different way than the crowd. You know, it's very easy to go, to go along with the crowd, you know, as we're even seeing in the global pandemic at the minute, it's very, it's very hard to, to have your own strength of character. Whenever I started, you know, my business, I was a stay at home mom. I had four kids. I decided I wanted to train as a bodybuilder. I only went, I only started in the gym. I was a yoga teacher until five years ago. I only started, I had never stepped foot in the gym before five years ago. And I decided I was going to do this. I was going to do bikini competition and 
build the business at the same time. And there wasn't one single person who supported me. Everyone told me I was crazy. My mother was embarrassed. You know, my husband didn't want me on stage in a sparkly bikini with men looking up my vagina. You know, it's like apart from anything, and all of the time I was training and going to the gym and trying to work on the business, was taking time away from the kids and my primary role as a mother. You know, had I not had a certain strength of character and certainly a vision as to where I was going to go, it would never have happened. You know, and I think that. Um, and so that now that I have achieved a, a quite a big, a reasonable level of success, people say to me, Christ, how did you do it? And suddenly it becomes interesting. And then they go, you're a bodybuilder and a multimillionaire and you run this massive company and you homeschool your kids and you're a vegan. And suddenly now they pay attention because it's, you know, and they go, oh, and suddenly now veganism becomes something that is associated with someone who's successful or powerful or, or whatever the adjectives you want to use are. Yeah, yeah. And I see that a lot in you, you know, tell us about the Navy SEAL. Like, how did that come about that you were training Navy SEALs? Did you fall into it or was it like a life? Yeah, so um, when I finished my degree, I actually, because I was already studying, when I was doing my degree for four years, I actually spent more time studying various martial arts than I did studying for my degree. <laughs> um, but uh, my plan was to come to the States for six months to train with a, a guy called Paul Vunak, who developed the uh, what's called the rapid assault tactics, which was at the time was the unarmed combat program for the Navy SEALs. So he happened to live in Orange County, California. So I came out to train with him. So he has people, he has people fly out for a couple of days. So him and I would train in the morning uh, and then we'd teach for five hours. I'd be his assistant instructor. And then, uh, then we'd train again in the evening, him and I. So um, he was already sort of uh, in that role. And then I sort of developed my own sort of credibility and started training, you know, so law enforcement and uh, Marines and, and Navy SEALs and so forth, because the, the Coronado uh, base is just down here and the uh, Camp Pendleton with the Marines, that's just down here as well. So just sort of proximity and then sort of just being in that world, you know, you just meet the, the people and um, just sort of went from there. And you realize what it actually takes to be mentally tough whenever you <laughs> Whenever you're in those kinds of circles, I can, I can bet it. Oh makes yeah, I, I couldn't do what uh, those guys do. I mean, it's just incredible. The, uh, uh, you know, being like hands tied behind your back and feet tied up underwater, yeah. uh, and things like that. Uh, that's uh, and especially in freezing cold water. That that wouldn't be my thing. Yeah, mental toughness on another level. I can't even imagine. And of course, I've just looked at the time. I can't believe we've been talking for so long. But I mean, I invited you on here specifically to talk about soy. And then I got mesmerized by your story, as I always do with people. But um, but I guess, you know, I I just I just love your story. I love I, I guess what is really apart from the amount of knowledge that you have, that anybody here who hasn't actually watched the Game Changers really should just go and watch it. You know what I mean? If you're yes, it's a very, very good investment of your time. It does, you know, you go into absolutely all of the research. Do you know what my actually because I do want to bring it back to nutrition for a bit, but I have to talk about something. Do you know the only time I've ever listened to a three-hour podcast was, uh, I sound like a fan now, was listening to you on uh, Joe Rogan. I've never listened to one of Joe Rogan's podcasts before because honestly, I just find them quite boring because they go on for too long. And I, you know, and I'm sure there's some really great ones and I'm definitely probably missing out. But I did listen to your entire, the entire episode in three settings. And it was absolutely epic. I love why you kept stopping going, how am I doing? Am I doing okay? How am I doing? Am I doing all right? Were you nervous or were you? Uh, I was, uh, I was a bit nervous. Yeah, I was going to re represent the film, um, but I was more amped up. I mean, I think my pupils were dilated. It was, it was like going into a fight. It was that kind of feeling, you know, cause we, it took seven I years. You won. To I think you won. Yeah. I mean, it, yeah, I think it was clear that I did win. I don't think that Chris Cress will ever be a guest on there again, even though before he was put forward, I think he'd been on like four or five times before, put forward as an expert. He'd done a previous episode, which I tried to get on, where he was going to debunk the film. And he said, oh, I spent seven hours looking at the research. And I was thinking, okay, I spent seven years making the film. And then you're coming out. And the, the annoying thing was when I watched the, uh, the debunk, I try to put myself in the mindset of not having read any of the nutrition science, just being like a regular person that's into maybe sports or working out. And, and what was crazy was when I listened to him, pretty much everything he said sounded convincing. So without my knowledge, and that's frustrating, right? Because Joe's podcast is one of the biggest, if not the biggest in the world. And so it's very influential. Uh, and the guests that you have on there are very skewed towards um, – you know, sort of more meat-based diet whenever he has nutrition people on there. And so people, that's all they're getting to hear, right? They're getting a curated um, sort of list of experts. 
And uh, it was frustrating to listen to because I was thinking, this, this sounds pretty convincing. Mm -hmm. And uh, obviously, it wasn't convincing ha having known what I know. And so, uh, yeah, I literally prepared for, for a whole week, uh, like 12 hours a day the week before that. And I was far more prepared than the topics. We, co we only covered like 15 or 20% of the topics that I was prepared for. I had 157 slides or something, uh, which I wanted to present uh, as evidence. And um, yeah, he was just like, I don't think the first hour went that well because Joe was on his side. It was a little bit two on one. I didn't pick the best uh, point to argue. Um, but I think by the end of it, you know, Joe was saying, yeah, you haven't lost an argument yet. And um, if people don't want to watch the whole thing, there are a couple of things on YouTube that I'd, I'd recommend, a couple of 20-minute pieces, one on protein quality and one on protein quantity. Uh, if you just want to watch those two 20-minute pieces, I think those are probably the most important because that's one of the biggest myths, right? For sure. And I think that one of the things that really gets my goat is I would consider myself to be you know, a critical thinker. So I'm very, I work very hard on finding out what, finding where are my vested interests and working to heal them or overcome them. And um, I work with my coach a lot because I don't ever want to, I, I definitely don't want to slant data based on my own perspective, which sometimes is hard not to do whenever you obviously, when, especially whenever you're vested. And so I find that whenever people are looking at a plant-based diet or look, even I find this with vegans a lot as well. I call them the angry preachy vegans. And I use like this witch voice whenever I'm like the angry vegans, you know, and they, they become very angry angry towards meat eaters and they're very angry and judgmental and they slant all the data. And so what they're, you know, and they come on and they'll say, oh, that'll destroy your health and that'll this and that'll that. And I go, well, actually, no, that's not true. If that person eats right. that, that's not going to destroy their health. That's you're, you're lying, <laughs> you know? Right. And so I think that being able to be a critical thinker is being able to see both sides, being able to say, well, yes, th this is what will happen if you eat a meat-based diet. This is what will happen if you eat a plant-based diet. This is what the science says. And, you know, and for there, just go kind of go ahead and make up your own mind. The thing that annoyed me, I guess, about the, the, the Joe Rogan, um, Chris Kressler was that it, it was, it was entirely slanted based on his, on his, and I'm not here to put him down in any way, but it was a, it was a biased slanted perspective, which certainly did not look evenly at both sides. And that's right, one right. thing I have to say, I love about you is that you, and why I was excited to have you on this podcast, because I, I truly see you as one of the, one of the few critical thinkers that I've certainly ever met, able to take data, look at data, evaluate data and see it separate from opinion. Does that make sense? Like data separate yeah, from opinion yeah, and being able to look at the data? I, I think because a lot of the, um, a lot of vegans, especially if they're ethically motivated, like to sort of make outlandish claims or try and make it sound better than it is. And, and the reality is, you know, like the evidence from 50% plants to say like 90, 95% plants is, is really quite strong. And the evidence from 90, 95% up to 100% really I think there is some evidence which I could say, okay, the precautionary principle, you're better off going 100% plants. But, you know, we're not trying to tell people to go vegan or vegetarian. We're trying to encourage plant-forward eating because the mm -hmm. science shows that the more you shift in a plant-based direction, the better you get. But again, that difference between 90 and 100%, that's going to be hard to prove, right? And so a lot of people are doing that because of their ethical beliefs or environmental beliefs or whatever. Um, but I think a lot of vegans push it too far. In fact, just yesterday, as an example, and I don't know what your take on this is, but someone was posting, it was a personal trainer, a vegan personal trainer, saying, look, vegans have 14% higher testosterone than non-vegans. Well, there is a study showing that, but what they're not saying is that they also had higher sex binding uh, uh, hormone globulin, and so that the free testosterone was actually much more important. And if you look at the the uh, preponderance of evidence, it's the free testosterone that matters, and free testosterone is basically the same. And so, rather than trying to make this claim uh, of vegans having higher testosterone, why don't we just be honest and not trying to uh, confuse people or delude them and saying, well, it's actually free testosterone that matters. And in, in that case, in fact, there was, there was just a, a meta-analysis, again, this year, showing there was no negative impacts on testosterone uh, or on estrogen levels in men with any sort of normal levels of consumption. Wow. Um, so uh, just going back to soy as an, as an example. I think it's because we get confused. I think we get we we buy into our own bullshit, our own belief about who we are, and then we become absolutely vested in keeping that. Like I remember, you know, people say to me all the time, "Oh, you know, have you noticed? Did you notice a huge difference after you went vegan in your hair and your skin and your nails?" And I'm like, 
no. And they're like, <laughs> really? And I'm like, no, no, don't think you're healthier. No, your energy. No, energy is the same. And they're like, huh. And they're like disappointed. They want you to say, oh, yes, yes. I noticed such a difference. I'm like, no, I didn't notice any difference, you know. But I'm not going to lie to people. I'm like you. I'm not going to try. And, right. But I think that that is the, and, and I, I guess I'm talking about this as well, because I do have a lot of ethical vegans listen to this podcast. And I they do become very passionate. And I'm always saying to them, please don't lie to people. You know, just you don't have to try and convince someone, scare someone or beat someone up or make them feel bad about their choices or, you know, anything like that. Just stand up and be a representation of of what it is that you believe in be, yeah. you know, and I love Jordan Peterson's quote. And he says, you know, um, tell the truth or at least don't lie, you know, like always aim to tell the truth and be honest about, you know, your feelings and your experiences and realize that just because you went vegan and you didn't notice a, an increase in boundless energy or your sex drive didn't go through the roof, doesn't mean anything about you. <laughs> it doesn't make veganism bad because the science there is, is to say that it is a much better diet. Um, I feel that you probably did research now that you've told me you did 12 hours for Joe Rogan's podcast and you maybe didn't do 12 hours a day for this one. You maybe did, but I, knowing you now, I know you probably did a lot and I didn't actually ask you very many questions about soy because I got too interested in your story. So I hope that was okay that you didn't mind. Oh yeah, no problem. Just, just touching on, on what you want what you just said is that I think the, the, there's a problem with being dishonest, right? Like if you say I've never since I've gone vegan, I've never been sick and my skin's better and my hair's better and I sleep better. And if you say all of that and then people try going vegan or mostly plant-based and they don't get those results, then they don't stick with it. So it's actually gonna work against you if you're pushing these things. I did genuinely um uh, get some some improvements. Like my endurance and my strength did improve. Now, whether it was the diet or not, nothing else changed for me really. But then somebody would say, oh, did you sleep better? No, I, my sleep didn't change. You know, oh, did it get rid of your, I've always been asthmatic since birth. Uh, did your asthma get better? Mm, maybe, I can't really tell. Like maybe that's, in, if it is, it could be a placebo. I still have to take uh, an inhaler, um, mm -hmm. you know, every day. Mm -hmm. um, sort of a long-term inhaler. So it didn't clear up everything. You know, um, I do feel pretty good for 43 years old. Uh, I'm stronger than I've ever been. Of course, people do increase strength over time anyway, the more strength training they're doing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, but uh, yeah, there's a lot of things that people try to get me to say, which I'm like, no, I don't really, Yeah. Um, you know, I didn't really have those. Some people do, some people don't. I think some people like to exaggerate based on their motivations. Yeah, no, I get, yes, exactly. That is actually a really, really good thing. They love to exaggerate based on their own motivations. And I do find that a lot to be true. And I think that all you can really do is, is, you know, as I said, be the best version of yourself. Um, I do want to finish up. I just want to, we are right out of time, but I want to um, circle back for just a second to the soy, because that, that what was part of the reason why I had you on and my coaches are going to kill me that I did not have a, a, I don't have something to post in the groups to say, but well, I do, I'm going to take the clip out of this, but have you found categorically, not categorically, have you found in any of your research, anything to suggest that soy is bad for women, especially, but human beings in general? Um, so it, it's not a straight up answer. So basically there are some things that look at these sort of highly concentrated phytoestrogens from soy. And if you have them in huge amounts and especially in rats, for example, then it looks like there, there could be some issues, right? But in humans, the vast preponderance of evidence, uh, with the robust science clearly shows that soy not only isn't detrimental, uh, for men and women, but is actually beneficial, um, especially in terms of, it seems, the hormonal cancers, so prostate and, uh, uh, and breast cancer, um, seems to have no negative impacts at all on testosterone or estrogen. Um, in fact, in some cases, it's been shown if, if people have got too lower estrogen in women, it's actually brought it into a more normal range in studies. There's no strong evidence or no good evidence really at all that soy is negative in any of those regards. And just this there, there was another meta-analysis done with randomized controlled trials, uh, finding that soy is actually effective in lowering levels of an inflammatory marker called uh, TNF-alpha. People have probably heard of CRP as an inflammatory marker. This looked at TNF-alpha. And uh, it just so showed that it was better in lowering those. And we know that inflammation is behind, you know, a leading cause behind cancer, heart disease, and so forth. And for athletes, it's also important. So just overall, soy is just beneficial. Again, it's just like anything. If you drink too much water, you can get hyponatremia and literally die. Right. right? So that doesn't mean that water is bad for you. 
right? So if you only ate soy and didn't have a varied diet, like maybe you could have some deleterious effects. But, you know, soy is, is a good inclusion. In the vast majority of people of diet, some people might have a soy allergy, uh, just like some people might have a peanut allergy. Um, and in that case, you know, it could be problematic. But for the vast, vast majority of people, soy is actually going to be beneficial to include in the diet. One more question, if I may be so bold. I remember listening to your Joe Rogan interview and I remember I remember calling my husband at the time and I was like, fuck, you have to listen to this. This guy is so fucking smart. I think he's so smart. But I remember it was because I loved how you picked apart um, something that Chris was saying, which was looking at the who's funding the studies that they're reading. It's not just about looking at the studies, but looking at what, where does the study originate from? Can you just tell me about that or just talk about that for a second or two? Because I know a lot of people are like, love to look at Google and go, well, Google said, and I read this one study. Yeah, unfortunately, the, the, the hard thing is that it sometimes takes hours and hours to figure out even from a single study. We have literally had to track, okay, who are the authors? And then look at each of the authors and then say, who, where does their funding come from? And then sometimes it's, the funding comes through these nonprofits. But industry is just heavily involved in funding these studies, especially the animal-based industry. And, and you do have to look. You can't just look. First of all, there's often headlines in the media about a study that aren't even reflective of the study's findings, right? So that's one thing. Sometimes they'll say, oh, vegans did this. And then you look at the study and it turns out that the vegans were actually fish eaters uh, or something. Um, and then it doesn't show, you know, or they'll say, this happened, and th but they don't mention that it was in rats and it was using a thousand times the amount of an extract from a food. Spin and slum. <clears throat> so there's misinformation from the media uh, about studies. And then when you look at the studies, there's a lot of bias. And unfortunately, it's driven by money. And uh, there's these large companies, right, like we mentioned some of them in the film, and they do the same bidding for the tobacco industry and they're using the same playbook and, and industry is funding a lot of these studies. So you really do have to dig. And unfortunately, it is just very time consuming uh, to really dig into um, uh, and to see who's funding the studies. Yeah. And I guess the if I can sum up what you're saying, it's question everything. Absolutely. Yeah. Oh. And, and don't buy, you know, from both sides. And I wouldn't take what I'm saying at face value. Unfortunately, it does take some time to look into it. Um, but I think that, you know, the ta a takeaway message is re really that all of the, even the large organizations, which uh, are corrupted in some way, um, even they now are recognizing that a plant forward diet, uh, is, is better than an animal based diet. And they're also recognizing that fully vegan diets are optimal, um, or beneficial can be beneficial for all stages of the life cycle, including, you know, pregnancy, infancy, uh adolescents uh, and including for athletes and so mm -hmm. that's what we've got to take away is that um the vast preponderance of evidence and the consensus of science is that shifting towards a plant-based diet is superior James, you have been an absolute joy it has been honestly a real pleasure to to speak to you i um i was looking forward to this interview i think probably I can't remember an interview I looked forward to more than this one, actually. So um, just want to say thank you so much for being here. You were uh, honestly the I, I love your candidness. I love the way you're 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 so self-aware. I think it's rare in many people to be as self-aware as you are. And also just, you know, the thank you so much, I guess, from thank you from vegans, even though I'm not vegan enough to be vegan. <laughs> thank you from the plant eating world. The animals, thank you, James. People always say that to me all the time. The animals, thank you. I'm like, eh, I'm pretty sure they don't, but that's all right. But um, thank you so much for everything you have done, you know, to and all of the research and all of the time and all of the energy and for being so committed to bringing the truth to people, because I think that the world needs more truth tellers and the world needs more critical thinkers and the world needs more people who are willing to stand up and and stand up for something, you know, especially something that is good and true and right. And I think that, um, I think that your mission is wonderful. I think you're very special. And I really just wanted to say thank you so much for being here today. It's been, no, thanks so much. It was great to, 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 um, you know, I followed you for a long time on, uh, on social media and, you know, you're a great role model. And so, uh, I really appreciate you having me on. Well, that was, uh, that was, you've no idea. I'm like, I got my James Milks to be following me. <laughs> so honestly, you are, you're amazing. Listen, um, and, I, and it really isn't any false kind of like oh, girly giggleness that I'm doing it with. Like you really are, like I followed you for a while and I think you're amazing and I'm going all kind of, you know, I'm going all silly on you now, but truly this has been brilliant. We are going to put it out, like I said, tomorrow. So, um, so we'll send you a link and, um, and, and hopefully we'll, uh, 
we'll maybe have you on again where I can ask you more scientific questions. We'll do part two where like literally we'll dig into food or something. Now that I feel like I know you. Awesome. Okay. James, thank you so much. I will um, catch up with you soon. Thanks, Kim. Okay. Appreciate thank it. Thank you. Bye. See ya. Bye. Well, oh my God, wasn't that amazing? Oh, I just loved talking to James, honestly. And I know I went all giggly at the end there. And now I'm, I'm totally judging myself for going giggly at the end. But I couldn't help it because I wasn't sure how I was going to finish it because I really just wanted to get down on my knees and worship him or kiss his feet or offer to carry his luggage or something. But, you know, <laughs> I resisted. And it is, and you know what? It's quite hard to interview one of your idols because, you know, you really want to be cool, but then you don't want to play it cool because if you play it cool, then you're not being natural. And if you're being natural, you kind of go all a bit silly and um, here anyway I don't know I hope it did okay and I hope you guys enjoyed that as much as I did and don't forget if you want to win a Sculpted Vegan program make sure you leave a review somewhere you listen to the podcast send me a screenshot on Instagram and you could be in with the chance of winning one of our Sculpted Vegan programs so all that is left for me to say is I hope you enjoyed this episode it was a clinker to come back from after a few weeks break thank you so much for waiting for me while I had my vacation and I will talk to you next week for another episode of the Kim Constable podcast bye for now <laughs>